All right, so guys, I want to begin with looking at some passages in Matthew today. And um, what I, what I want to bring up here is the, the topic of what's called nominal faith. Now, I mentioned this a little bit with John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, where many were professing faith in Jesus when they saw his signs, but he wasn't professing faith in their profession of faith because he knew their heart. And basically what we get taught, the technical... Um, the technical way of understanding that is their uh, faith is an expression of uh, belief that means you're going to follow someone and and submit your life to their control now we have different types of faith and the bible really describes as two categories of faith one that is made on the basis of the own human heart and and that follows the the course of the own human heart this would make sense since we die that faith can die, right? But the faith that the Spirit gives when you're born again, right? The faith that's a gift of God, right? This is Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you've been saved your faith. That is a gift, not as a result of any works you've done, so you can't boast, right? That kind of faith, since it's the gift, the work of the Holy Spirit, it now has the capacity to live forever and never fail to trust and rest in the one in whom that faith is put jesus christ okay and so that's one of the reasons it's the other side if you will where jesus says that my sheep hear my voice and they will follow me where he says that um the father is is greater than anyone in this world and if the father has put you in my hands no one can take you out of my hands all right uh, that those are those ideas from john chapter 10 but i want to look at that from our perspective because we have a lot of folks who say amen to Jesus sincerely, but they aren't where Jesus is. And I'm going to give you an example, and you're not going to like it. Um, and, and that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm a preacher, which means that, you know, God has given me a reason for people to not like me. You know, um, I was kind of born that way, you know, a little bit of a jerk. And... Um, God said, hmm, I'm going to give that boy a blessing. I'm going to make him a preacher. Then people will know why they don't like him. All right? So Isaiah, at the second half of his book, is, is prophesying to the, the people of God. That would be us as well. And he says about the time when the Messiah comes and what he's going to do. Remember Isaiah 53, we see that wonderful description of Jesus in, in the, the torture preceding the crucifixion. And then the work of the crucifixion, taking upon him our rebellions and paying for them the the wrath of god well in isaiah 58 he's starting to talk about some of the applications and he's talking about um at the first here he's talking about those who make a profession of faith and and even will do christian things but they're not doing them for the right reasons and it demonstrates in that they're not consistent all right and um he challenges them for example in their fasting You'll actually have people who will make a big deal out of fasting. It was a form of praying. And, and Jesus here is saying through the prophet Isaiah, your fasting is worthless because you don't have a really living relationship with me. So this whole idea of nominal faith, that which is born of our own efforts versus the faith which is born of the Spirit's work is very, very important to us. And here Jesus says in verse 13 of Isaiah 58, keep the Sabbath day holy. What do you mean by that? Well, he, he means to, to set it apart as sacred for God's usage. So if the Sabbath is to be set apart for God's own usage, what does that mean? Well, don't pursue your own interests on that day, but instead enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath and everything you do and don't follow your own desires or talk idly. And then he goes on to say, then the Lord will be your delight and I'll give you great honor and you will inherit all the promises given in Jesus Christ. And, and I'm summarizing at this point, okay? I, the observation here, as we listen to this, do you saying I have to go to church in order to be saved? The answer is no, you've got it backwards. You've got it backwards. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Let me make the observation um, from nominal Christianity um, the Barna Research Group, some people know about them. They've been around for a while. They, they're at least consistent. They, they constantly are changing their definition of what a, 
incredible profession of faith is. What, what they think you have to demonstrate in your life in order to actually possibly have born again fruit. Now they're not saying they know that for a fact, they're just saying you'll know them by their fruits, right? And so they've moved their definition over the years. It used to be you go to church every weekend on Wednesday night, right? That was back in the 90s. And now it's shifted. A credible believer, one who they say has a reason to say, yeah, I'm saved, is someone that goes to a church service. It could be anything, okay? It could be anything. 2.3 times a month. Now, if this is on Sundays that they're going, what that means is two Sundays, they're there in the morning, probably not in the evening, all right? And one of those Sundays, they're there for about a third of the time and then they leave, <laughs> all right? But Isaiah says, on the Sabbath, you go, well, what did that look like for them? It began with the morning sacrifice and it ended with the evening sacrifice. When did they do the morning sacrifice? About 6 a.m. When did they do the evening sacrifice? About 6 p.m. I mean the whole day they were somehow worshiping the Lord? Yeah. Now, I'm with you. If you hear that and go, oh, I can't do that. I can barely stomach three hours in the morning. And then a couple of Sundays, because we're trying to reintroduce it, a couple of Sundays a month, we have the evening service at five, you know, five to six. You know, and, and, and then we're done, and, and I want to go home, and I just want to relax, and my wife invites people over for fellowship. And I'm like, what the? Come on! I just want to watch my favorite stupid show on TV. I don't want to... I mean, so, you know, if you're a nominal Christian, it can be hard. Right, so go to Matthew 7 with me. I've been here before with you guys. You know, it, it, it's important that our convictions don't rest on what a preacher says. It's, it's, it's okay, God works through a preacher speaking, but only to the degree he's consistent with the Word of God. So it's always important to see that this is what the Word of God says. And so here in verse 15, he's warning them about false prophets who would come in his name. And Jesus says you can identify them by their fruits. Now, this applies to all believers then, okay, because... It's a greater to a lesser argument. If this applies to preachers, it applies to the people that the preacher's talking to as well. And he really says, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Don't miss the obvious here. He's saying that the kind of plant it is produces the kind of fruit particular to it. <clears throat> so that a person who has a credible, born-again, spirit-given relationship with Jesus will have the growing fruit. And what the fruit we've identified here this morning is a growing desire to worship God on the Sabbath. You with me so far? He says, you'll know by fruit, good tree can't produce bad fruit, a bad tree can't produce good fruit. And then it goes on from there. Uh, the real simple thing is, it's possible to say, I trust in Jesus, but that come from a decision of my own heart. And I can know that by looking at the fruit of my life. Now, I'll let you in ahead of time on the solution. If, if you are looking at Scripture and you, you, you think, oh, yeah, Reed really is a jerk, that's fine. As long as you walk away going, but the Bible makes it clear, and I'm a little nervous. The fruit that I have, according to Isaiah 58, doesn't look good. I'm worried about my love for worship of the Lord. Well, good news. If you respond to that with humility, God's opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. If you respond with humility, that's a good sign that you've been saved, that the Holy Spirit has given you Jesus' humility. That's one of the gifts. And the reason you're responding the way you are, you might not like it, but you're not fighting it. You might not like it, but you're not arguing about it. You might not like it, but you're not trying to kill the messenger. Please don't try and kill the messenger. Okay. You're willing to go, all right. And you're willing to then go, God, I'm sorry. Please help me with this. You're willing to express repentance. That's a good sign. So that's where this is all going to go. But I want to dig a little deeper because Jesus does. In Matthew 13, he gives us an explanation of one of the possibilities for why we don't have the fruit in our lives. And he explains this parable of the four different soils. 
the parable of the sower, or the parable of the seeds. The seed that fell on the, the footpath, we could say on the gravel, all right, represents those who hear the gospel but don't understand it, and the evil one, Satan, comes and immediately snatches it away. They hear it and they go, oh, that's stupid. Hey, did you see that girl? That's what those guys do, okay? Sadly, today, that's what those gals do, okay? All right? Uh, the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and they receive, they receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, it doesn't last long, they fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. And so that's the person who gets kind of giddy and excited about it, and they go tell their unsaved friends and their unsaved friends, oh, what are you, a Bible thumper? A holy roller? A holy jug? Come on. They get picked on because, you know, we don't live in Pakistan where they have real serious persecution. Or in China. Or, I hate to say this, or in Canada lately. You don't know if you've been paying attention to the persecution in Canada. It's hilarious. All over COVID. You have churches being closed. All right? Police showing up and invading worship services. I'm not exaggerating. It's the craziest thing in the world. These are the kinds of people who, when they hear the gospel, the cares of the world are like weeds. Or excuse me, the rocks of the world are like weeds, and it chokes out persecution. All right, now, the cares of the world, the, the weeds, all right? The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, by the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced these are the folks who say amen jesus and they may come to church once or twice but then they're worried about well they're worried about finding a place to live they're worried about getting to work on time they're worried about making sure their car works they're worried about making sure they get food on the table and y'all can sit here and say read those are legitimate needs yeah i i got you i understand and they never conflict with serving god particularly on the sabbath you go with me to Matthew chapter 6. And he says these amazing things, starting in verse 19. Where he tells them not to store treasures on earth, but to store treasures in heaven. And, and then he warns them that they've got to be making sure that their eyes are desiring the right things of this world. Lest they desire things of darkness. That would be things of this world. that are going to corrupt and then he makes it specific. You can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and the pursuit of the things in this world. He calls it money. He's not talking about the person who says, if I go to church, I'll get to know God better. If I take that time and I invest in my stocks, I might make $1,000 more. I'll go. No, he's not talking about that guy. He's talking about the guy who, you ready? I got to worry about making sure my car works so I can get to work tomorrow morning on time because Nolan's a pain in the butt. I got to make sure I get that. And then what happens on Sunday morning? This is my time. I ain't moving. That's what he's talking about. How do I know that? Well, we look at the next verses, beginning in verse 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. He's not talking about the rich person in the pursuit of money. He's talking about the ordinary Joe in the pursuit of ordinary life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds, they don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can you add a single moment of time to your life by worrying? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. We'd say wildflowers. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so one of you for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying what should we eat or drink or what should we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. And there it is. But your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else as your primary goal, as the goal of that everything else is a sub-goal to. And live righteously. Seek your relationship with him. And he's going to give you everything you need. Now, this is not a promise of earthly prosperity. 
Some God gives earthly prosperity to so that they'll have more to share with those who don't. He builds his family that way through the sharing. And we see that going in our congregation now, right? We've got some people who don't have as much. We've been helping out some. God's bringing us together. It's a wonderful thing, okay? That's exactly what he's telling us here. If you've been born again, then it will be seen in your life. And you will find yourself, as you worry about ordinary life, you will find yourself in conflict, make it simple for ourselves, with what you do on Sunday. Now, it's more than that, but it's at least that. Okay? And when that conflict happens, if you are the seed planted in the right soil, if you're not the seed planted in the weedy soil that gets choked out by the cares of the world, I got to make sure I get to work on Friday and I'm going to ignore God on Sunday. If that's true of your faith, then you will long to go closer to Christ. You will find it on the inside. It may be prompted by the preacher on the outside every now and then. It may be prompted by something you're reading in the Bible completely on your own. That happened to me when I was a young Christian. No preacher, just read my Bible on my own and it smacked me right between the eyes. All right? It may happen through the ordinary means that God has promised to use. It will not happen through any other means. Listen to this very carefully because these are the only ones God's promised to use. So don't put yourself in a situation where I'm just going to take walks on Sunday morning and ask God to tell me what he wants me to do. I already could tell you what God tells you wants you to do. Read your Bible. Okay, it's right there. Well, but I don't feel like it. Oh, okay. I can tell you what God wants to do about that as well. He wants to tell you your feelings are selfishly wicked and evil and are going to send you to hell. What? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We now turn to Matthew chapter 16. Let me get there to the right verse. I think it's down in verse 24. Jesus says to the disciples, if any of you want to be my follower, if you want to have faith in me and submit to me as the Lord of your life, you must give up your own way and take up your cross and follow me. You must give up this dream of conquering in your own life, in your own name, and you must take up the sign of sacrifice. You must submit in following me. If you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it, Jesus says. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. What do you benefit you if you gain the whole world, like a Warren Buffett or a Bill Gates or an Elon Musk? If you gain the whole world but lose your own soul, is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels at the end of time in the glory of the Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of man coming in his glory. He's talking about those who saw his resurrection, that he might give hope to us who hear this message and go, if this is true, I'm screwed. Okay, recognizing that if it's true that you are screwed is possibly the beginning of good news because this is where God gives repentance. He gives repentance to the humble and humility begins by going, God's word is right. It has judged my life. And I've come up wanting. I'm like Belteshazzar, not Belteshazzar, I was Daniel. Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, in the book of Daniel. That finger starts writing on the wall, many, many tikal farsum, which just means weighed, weighed, found wanting. Okay? That was a, that was, what's going to happen on the day of judgment, Revelation 20? Belshazzar happened that night when he was having a party in an orgy. Okay, could you imagine how bad that was? Girl sitting on your lap, you're getting stoned, and all of a sudden there's the hand of God on the wall telling you you're going to hell that night man man that's exactly what jesus is warning for those who don't have the fruit and jesus is warning that so that we might examine ourselves in the presence of the word of god and simply apply it if you don't see the fruit of your life of a growing desire to repent where your life doesn't match the word of god and just use this Sabbath test. If you don't see that happening, then you need to be worried. If you see your desire to repent moving in that direction, well then take courage, take hope, and respond to it. You see, for, for those who have been saved, God grows them in their confidence. I'm a preacher. Guess what my worst day of the week is? 
Sunday. I hate getting up on Sunday morning. I am absolutely miserable because on the one hand, I'm tired, I'm lazy, I'm a little older, and I'm not in good shape. I'm gaining too much weight again. All right? Okay. It's not this, it's this. Okay? All right? Thanks for the peanut gallery again. Put me on my spot. That's great. Okay? I don't want to move. All right? I don't, I mean, I, it used to be I'd want to stay up Saturday night late and then have fun all into the night and then, you know, sleep in Sunday morning. Now, I just want to go to sleep, <laughs> you know? And so I got to go to church. And I got to do something that I'm not good at. I, I'm a bit of an introvert. I'm not good at, at saying hi to people and being kind to people. And, to, and I'm supposed to be the leader of this stuff. This is ridiculous. And yet that's the ta task God's called me to as a preacher. And so I get up there in all of my weakness, in all of my frailties, and I say, God, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. Forgive me. Forgive me for not trusting you. And help me to trust you. Help me to call the Sabbath a delight, even though that part of me that doesn't trust you wants to call it worthless. And change me. And so that's what's happened over the years. I've moved from being someone who resented God's challenge on my time to being someone who recognized that Sunday is a beginning of eternity. And if I don't find myself growing in my desire for him on Sunday, how can I ever expect to find him delightful throughout all eternity? And so it becomes this wonderful gift, guys. So that, that's what I want to offer you to you today. Uh, take the test. Look at your own life. See if the fruit's there. Submit to the Word of God, and wherever you're struggling with it, turn it over to Jesus, talk to Him about it, and watch what He does. Thanks, guys.